Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Schaefer, Dr. Schaefer. Uh, on January 19, 1961, it was a snowy day in Washington. President-elect John F. Kennedy and some members of his cabinet went to the White House to meet with outgoing President Dwight Eisenhower. Eisenhower was to brief them on foreign affairs, as was Secretary of State Christian Hutter. They did that, and Eisenhower said privately to Kennedy, Berlin is a place that worries me. I think we're going to have a crisis there. We've managed to postpone it, but it's going to come up probably pretty quickly. Christian Hutter, the Secretary of State, briefed them on how Khrushchev in 1958 had issued an ultimatum that they were all to agree to sign a peace treaty for Germany within six months. If they did not do that, he would sign a private treaty just with East German party boss and dictator Walter Ulbricht, and then after that, the Allies would have to get their rights from Walter Ulbricht. At that point, they would no longer be able to fly in the corridors the way they had been flying. They would no longer be able to go back and forth to Berlin on a special privileged autobahn, which only the Soviets checked, and they would no longer be able to take their special trains. So. Khrushchev had a menace right there, and Eisenhower warned Kennedy that there were many signs that Khrushchev would, in fact, act on it. I will not go into the details of the whole story because it's in the book, and I urge you, of course, to read it. But I will talk here about four things. The Vienna summit, June 3rd and 4th, 1961, between Khrushchev and Kennedy. The start of the wall on August 13, 1961. Checkpoint Charlie tank confrontation, October 1961, and the connection between the Cuban Missile Crisis and Berlin in October 1962. When Kennedy became president on January 20th, the day after he'd met with Eisenhower, he staffed his White House with the people whom everybody called the best and the brightest. McGeorge Bundy, who had been dean of faculty at Harvard University, Walt Rostow, who had been a scholar of everything at Harvard University, and a number of other people. He also brought on board the best possible experts on the Soviet Union, George Kennan, whom he had known personally for quite some time, Chip Boland, uh, ambassador who had served in Moscow, as Kennan had, and he also brought on board several other people whom he consulted from time to time, like Tommy Thompson, who was the ambassador to Moscow, and Foy Kohler, who was assistant secretary for European affairs, but also a Soviet hand. There was only one European hand who was in the senior levels of the White House, and that, interestingly enough, was Henry Kissinger, who was there only on a part-time basis. He couldn't leave Harvard, so he spent 25% of his time at the White House. He found it rather frustrating because whereas Kennedy, with his Soviet experts, looked at Berlin through a lens focused on Moscow, Kissinger believed that one should look at Berlin through a lens focused on Western Europe, on West Germany, that the important thing to do was to protect Berlin so as to maintain the Allied position in Germany. But he found himself consistently frustrated, even though he had some good meetings with Kennedy, he could not get Kennedy to agree with him. And he finally left at the end of 1961. He resigned, and he left with a memo to Schlesinger in which he said, quote, I am in the position of a man sitting next to a driver who is heading for a precipice. And the driver is asking him to make sure that the tires are properly inflated and that the oil pressure is adequate. That was not what Kissinger wanted as a role. He thought that Kennedy was heading for disaster, and he wanted to make sure that he could not make a contribution, so he might as well leave. Khrushchev made nice to Kennedy. He was delighted that Kennedy became president. He hated Nixon. He was so glad that Kennedy won. And within a few weeks of Kennedy's victory, even before Kennedy had become president, Khrushchev sent word through some American journalists and also through some Soviets that he wanted to have a good relationship with Kennedy and that he looked forward to it. Kennedy, in response, had a meeting with his Soviet experts and in February sent a memo, excuse me, a letter to Khrushchev indicating that he hoped that they would have an early meeting. Khrushchev sat on the invitation. He had had 
intelligence reports that the United States was going to attack Cuba. He alerted Castro, told him what to expect, and then he decided to sit and wait. Well, as you know, the American invasion took place. It was the Bay of Pigs. It was not an American invasion. Actually, it was a group of Cuban exiles whom the Americans landed. And as you also know, Castro was ready, and the uh, Cubans had to surrender, and the whole thing was a disaster. But what fascinated Khrushchev was that Kennedy let it be a disaster. He thought that Kennedy would use some of those planes that were flying overhead, or that he would use some of those ships that were cruising off the coast of Cuba in order to land troops and in order really to take over the island. But Kennedy didn't do it. Khrushchev said to his son, Sergei, you know, I don't understand Kennedy. Perhaps he lacks determination. And at that moment, he changed his mind about Kennedy. He decided that there was no sense talking to this man on an even basis because this man was weak. He called him a boy in short pants. Khrushchev respected age, and he did not respect people who were too young, and he certainly did not respect people who did not act the way he would have acted. He was a fighter. If his friends were losing, he would do everything he could to make them win. But Kennedy did not do that, and Khrushchev decided that he was facing a weak American president. He was reinforced in his opinion by Menshikov, who was the Soviet ambassador to Washington, and who said, excuse me, who wrote to Khrushchev that, quote, when there is a real crisis, Kennedy will drop a load in his pants. That's not a nice thing to say about the head of state to whom you're accredited, but that's what he believed, and that's what Khrushchev was beginning to believe. Khrushchev was, had a chance to test this theory in June 1961, when he and Kennedy met in Vienna. But the Kennedy preparation for the summit was a disaster. In fact, as a Foreign Service officer, I can tell you that I was shocked by some of the things I read in the Kennedy Library, what people had sent to Kennedy. Ambassador Tommy Thompson, who had been personally warned by Khrushchev that he wanted to settle Berlin in Vienna, and that he was going to be hard on that subject, sent a cable to Washington saying that Khrushchev would glide over Berlin in sweetness and light. The State Department mm -hmm. sent a memo to Kennedy, a pre-meeting memo, in which they said they were expecting a positive meeting and that Khrushchev would be prepared to delay on the Berlin issue. Only a Soviet agent, whom Robert Kennedy had befriended, told the Americans the truth. He told Bobby that there would be a tough meeting, that Khrushchev was going to be hard on Berlin. Kennedy replied, Bobby replied, you know, on this one, the president is hard set. He's not going to pull out the troops. And so Bobby said to Jack, we're going to have trouble, but nobody else did. Well, as it turned out, Bolshakov and Bobby were right. When the summit began, Kennedy began with two proposals, two ideas. The first idea was to divide the world, and particularly to divide Europe. He said to Khrushchev, and this is in the record, as far as I'm concerned, you can maintain your position in East Berlin, and you can maintain your position in Eastern Europe. We want to maintain our position in Western Europe, and we want to maintain our position in West Berlin. Khrushchev absolutely and totally rejected that. He said, you cannot prevent the people from acting as they want to act. Then. Kennedy, basing on his briefings in Washington, said to Khrushchev, you know, we all have nuclear weapons now. We have to make sure that we avoid miscalculation, that we avoid getting into a war as people got into a war in World War I. Khrushchev blew up. He jumped up. He said, I do not want to hear the word miscalculation again. What you are trying to do is to tell the Soviet people to sit on their hands like schoolboys. We will not do that. Kennedy retreated and made a quiet promise that he would never use the word miscalculation again. But he had met the real Khrushchev, who was absolutely determined. He was a believer in the progress and the future of communism. He was not going to sit down and let anybody talk him out of it. 